There are many Christians today who believe that the kingdom of God has no relevance for today. They believe that His kingdom is a kingdom for the future. Therefore, things must get worse and worse for now. And their only duty is to document this deterioration by comparing the distress of the day to their prophecy charts. They believe that His kingdom has no implications in the earth today. They do not believe that God's kingdom is to expand in the earth. Rather, they believe that God's kingdom rule is to be relegated to the hearts of believers. Therefore, those who believe in Jesus are to live in a narcissistic fairyland and just hold the fort until Jesus returns. Is this the teaching of Scripture regarding the kingdom of God? The title of my sermon this morning is God's Expanding Kingdom. Let's stand up and we'll have a word of prayer. Father, we give thanks and praise unto you that we can all be gathered here together this morning to worship you to learn from Your Word also, God. Father, I just pray that You help me to set forth that which You've given me to share, that it be used for good in the hearts of all those who are here this morning and those who even hear of this later on. Father, I ask and pray that You would be glorified, that Your Holy Spirit would do a great work in each heart and mind. And we ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. You could be seated. The first thing I want you to know this morning is this. God has a kingdom. In Mark chapter 1, verse 14, the Scripture says, Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Acts chapter 28, verses 30 and 31 says, Then Paul dwelt two whole years in his own rented house and received all who came to him preaching the kingdom of God. Of God. In Romans chapter 14, verse 17, Paul says, For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Suffice it to say, God has a kingdom. And that's the first thing I want you to know this morning. God has a kingdom. The Bible, in fact, speaks of God's kingdom over and over and over again, scores of times. Just pull out your concordance. And look up the word kingdom, and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. The second thing I want you to know this morning is that His kingdom is here in the earth now. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 10, Jesus is teaching us how to pray, and He says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. What is Jesus teaching us here? He's teaching us that we are to pray for God to establish His kingdom in the earth. His kingdom is here. In Luke chapter 11, Jesus is addressing some folk that thought He was casting out demons by the power of Satan. And in verse 19, He says, And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. And then in verse 20, the Scripture says, But if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. His kingdom is here in the earth now. It's not just some future thing. His kingdom is here now. Turn to Luke chapter 17, verse 20. And look at what Jesus says to the Pharisees. Luke chapter 17, verse 20. The Scripture says this, Now when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, See here or see there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. What was Jesus saying to the Pharisees? He was telling them, The kingdom is already here. See, they thought it was going to come with some fanfare, maybe a marching bagpipe band leading a bunch of warriors with, you know, God coming on some throne. That's what they were expecting. And Jesus is telling them, no, the kingdom is here. The kingdom's already upon you. God's kingdom is here now, brothers and sisters. 
Now, there is a future aspect to God's kingdom. Many verses of Scripture make this clear. But it's when people say that the kingdom only has a future aspect that people err. Because the Scriptures are also clear that His kingdom is in the earth now. Not just in the sweet by and by, off in the future. One of the most favorite verses of those who say God's kingdom is not here now, only in the sweet by and by, off in the future, is John chapter 18, verse 36, where Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. Turn to John chapter 18, verse 36. I want you to look at that verse with your own eyes. You can begin in verse 33. This is a favorite verse of those who want to say that Jesus' kingdom is just some thing off in the sweet by and by, off in the future. It's got nothing to do with earth or anything to do with the present at all. Starting in verse 33, Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Are you speaking for yourself about this or did others tell you this concerning me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Jesus is not speaking of the geographical location of his kingdom in this portion of Scripture. Rather, he is speaking of the origin of his kingdom when he says, my kingdom is not of this world. It's not that the, his kingdom isn't in the earth now. It is in the earth now. The Scriptures are clear on that. Jesus isn't talking about geographical location here. He's talking about origin. And it did not originate from earth. It originated with God in heaven. Amen? Jesus never taught that his kingdom had nothing to do with earth. He never taught that his kingdom had no relevance to this earth or no implications in this earth. He taught just the opposite. He taught that his kingdom is here on this earth now. So the first thing I want you to know this morning is that God is a kingdom. The second thing I want you to know this morning is that His kingdom is here in the earth now. The third thing you need to know this morning is this. God intended for His kingdom to expand in the earth. Okay? His kingdom is meant to expand in the earth. Turn to Matthew chapter 13, verse 31. Matthew chapter 13, verse 31. He put forth, talking about Jesus another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds. But when it is grown, it is greater than the herbs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. What's Jesus teaching here? He's teaching, number one, that God has a kingdom. He's teaching, number two, that his kingdom is here. And he's teaching number three, and most importantly in this parable, that his kingdom is to expand. Is this not true? Although it may be this little dinky seed, it's going to grow up into a huge tree so that the fowls of the air can come and nest in it. God's kingdom is to expand in the earth, brothers and sisters. Look at Luke chapter 13, verse 20. Luke chapter 13 Verse 20, Jesus says here, To what shall I liken the kingdom of God? It is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was all leavened. What is leaven? It's this small substance which is added to this big lump of dough, which when it is added, it expands and permeates the whole lump of dough. Is this not true? This is what his kingdom is like. It is to be expanding. It is to be growing, just like the mustard seed. And it is to expand and affect and affect the whole earth, just like lemon. His kingdom does have implications in the earth. It is to be growing. 
His kingdom is not just for the future, but His kingdom is in the earth now, growing. Remember what Jesus taught again in Matthew chapter 6, verse 10? He said, pray this way, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God's kingdom is to expand. It has implications in the earth. This is the clear teaching of Scripture. Now, that we've established that, let me address how God expands His kingdom in the earth. And we need to begin by asking ourselves this question. What is the vehicle whereby God expands His kingdom in the earth? What is the vehicle whereby God expands His kingdom in the earth? This is an important matter. Let me first share with you three means people have used down through history to try and expand God's kingdom in the earth, which are not the vehicles whereby God expands His kingdom in the earth. They are, number one, military action. Number two, political action. And number three, social action. These are not the vehicles that God uses. Down through history, both heretics and true believers have tried to expand God's kingdom through any one of these. Let's take military action first. Military action is not the vehicle that God uses to expand His kingdom in the earth, brothers and sisters. This has been used by heretics and by true believers down through the ages. Right now, we have a present-day example of heretics trying to use military action as the vehicle whereby they see God's kingdom expand on the earth. They're known as liberation theologians. They're leftists who actually teach from the Word of God that we are to arm ourselves, put together death squads, and go out and murder people in order to see God's kingdom established in the earth. I've done a sermon before on their teachings and looked at the verses that they use. And you can get that sermon... It is pathetic, their interpretation of Scripture and their distortion of the Word of God. There have also been, however, true believers who thought they could expand God's kingdom through military action. One of them was one of my heroes, Oliver Cromwell. He thought that he could expand God's kingdom in the earth through military might. He did a great work in England. And then you know what happened? He died, and only five years later, after he died, after all that he did in reforming England, cutting off the king's head and all that great stuff, you know what happened? The people brought King Charles' son back to England and put him on the throne. Another thing Oliver Cromwell tried to do is he tried to wipe out Catholicism out of Ireland. Guess what? It didn't work. You can't expand God's kingdom through military action. That is not how God designed His kingdom to be expanded. Not that way. God did not design His kingdom to be expanded through military force. Thomas Munzer, who lived several hundred years ago, was a leader in the German peasant revolt. And he encouraged his followers to strap on their swords in order to exterminate the ungodly. For, quote, the ungodly have no right to live save what the elect choose to allow them. End of quote. Now, there's a pro-choice guy we could get along with, right? (laughs) Just joking. Okay. (laughs) Needless to say, Thomas Munzer and his crew ended up slaughtered. Okay, military force is not the means whereby God expands his kingdom in the earth. That's what I'm trying to get through to you. God does not use military conquest as the vehicle whereby he expands his kingdom in the earth. But let me add this. Not all military action is wrong. Passivism is a heresy. And I can prove that from the word of God. Not all military action is wrong. The Bible is clear on this. Let me give you just a few examples. John the Baptist was asked by the soldiers, what should we do? What did he say? 
Did he tell them to turn their swords into plowshares? Uh, to put on um, nice um, linen and go stand on the corner and um, sell tulips to people and make a vow to pacifism? No. He told them to be honest in what they're doing. They could remain soldiers. There's nothing wrong with military action. God himself in the book of Exodus is called a man of war. And he has done great battles down through history, has he not? In Revelation chapter 19, verse 11, the Scripture is talking about Jesus. The Scripture says this about Jesus. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. Guess who? Jesus. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. So there's nothing wrong with military action. I mean, look what it goes on and says. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with military action. It's just this. Military force is not the vehicle that God uses to expand his kingdom in the earth. That's what you need to understand. Military action has its place in God's economy, and God may even use a military action for His purposes or to expand His kingdom, but military action is not the vehicle by which He expands His kingdom in the earth. That's what we need to understand. Number two, political action. God does not expand His kingdom. He does not, he does not use a political party as the vehicle whereby he expands his kingdom in the earth. One of the biggest problems we have in Christianity today is that so many Christians have tied themselves to the Republican wagon. And you know what happens when Christians did that? They no longer were speaking prophetically, you know, holding the Democrats accountable or the Republicans accountable because they tied themselves to the Republican wagon they ceased to speak prophetically. You see that all the time. Look at Marlon Maddox in his show. He will say all kinds of things against the Democrats as much as he can. But every time the Republicans do something rotten, which is almost as often as the Democrats, he doesn't say anything about it. And that's why we have a serious problem in America today. What we need to understand is is that we are not to tie ourselves to a political party. Now, some of you might say, well, gee, Pastor Matt, you've tied yourself to the United States Taxpayers Party pretty strongly. Yes, I have. And what is the U.S. Taxpayers Party? A small band of men speaking prophetically to the political arena and to this nation regarding God's law concerning civil matters. That's who they are. And I will tell you this. If the U.S. Taxpayers Party goes against God's word, I will denounce them just as strongly from this pulpit as I have denounced the Democrats and the Republicans. Because we must never tie ourselves to a political party. We tie ourselves, brothers and sisters, to this word. And we hold all political parties accountable to it, no matter what party they are. Now listen to this. We should be involved in politics. That is clear. A lot of Christians think we shouldn't be involved in politics. Why? Because they think, um, you know, that man created government. Man did not create government. God did. God instituted government. A lot of Christians think, well, I'm just going to be involved in church things, quote unquote, because God instituted the church. Well, I need to inform them that God not only instituted the church, he also instituted civil government in the earth. And he makes it very clear how 
civil government is to function. A political party, listen to me now, can be the result of proper biblical teaching. It can be an expression of God's kingdom in the earth. But it is not the vehicle whereby God expands His kingdom in the earth. Do you got that? And that's an important distinction to make and to understand. So, number one, the vehicle is not military action. Number two, the vehicle is not political action. Number three, social action. Many Christians, listen to me now, become leftists because they try to do God's work through the financial arm of the state. They establish social agencies and get finances from the state to do, quote-unquote, kingdom work. Now, you all know my pure disdain for socialism and for socialists. <laughs> it is a pure disdain. Okay? So forget about them and their idiocy, which I just mentioned. But what about on our side of the fence? On our side of the fence... There exists a plethora of parachurch ministries. Let me tell you, brothers and sisters, God does not use parachurch ministries as the vehicle. Parachurch ministries are not the vehicle whereby God expands His kingdom in the earth. Now, parachurch ministries can be the result of proper biblical teaching. They can be an expression of God's kingdom in the earth. But they are not the vehicle whereby God expands His kingdom in the earth. God does not do it through military action. That's not the vehicle. Political action, that's not the vehicle. Social action, that's not the vehicle. What is the vehicle then that God uses to expand His kingdom in the earth? It's the church. It's the church. Turn to Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. Look what Jesus said regarding the church. This is the vehicle, brothers and sisters, that God uses to expand His kingdom in the earth. Important for us to realize that. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. Jesus is talking to Peter and He says to him, I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Regarding His statement. And then He says, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The gates of hell shall not prevail against what? Christ's church. This is an offensive statement, brothers and sisters. This is not a defensive statement. It isn't like the church is standing still, the hold the fort mentality that most Christians have today. It isn't like the church is standing still in one spot and it's beating off the attacks of hell hoping for Jesus to rapture us out any second now just so we can get out by the sweat of our brow. No. The gates of hell are standing still. And the church, God's kingdom, is expanding in the earth so much so that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. The church will flatten the gates of hell and lay them waste. Why? Because it's expanding. It's getting bigger and bigger. At least it's supposed to be. <laughs> Hopefully with, we can reverse some of this retreatism that is so prevalent in Christianity today. The reason many Christians look to military action or political action or social action as the vehicles whereby God expands His kingdom in the earth is because they view the church as self-centered or corrupt or failing so they look for a new vehicle to expand the kingdom. This is very important. Let me repeat it to you. The reason many Christians look to military action or political action or social action as the vehicles whereby God expands His kingdom in the earth is because they view the church as self-centered or corrupt or failing, so they look for a new vehicle to expand the kingdom. They know what the church is to be from reading the Bible, but they don't see the church being what Christ intended it to be. So the church fathers knew what Christ intended the church to be. They knew that He intended His kingdom to expand in this earth. Read the writings of the church fathers. They all believed that the church should have an impact upon the culture. They all did. 
and that it should transform the culture in which it finds itself. Charles Wesley put it this way. He said, individual change brings societal change. But if there is no societal change, then there's been no individual change. The kingdom of God wins people to itself one by one through the preaching of the gospel. Let's stand up and we'll close in a word of prayer.